Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I'm talking to Dr. Andrea Love. She has a PhD in immunology and microbiology, and she is a self-confessed lifelong science nerd publishing numerous peer-reviewed papers. She has a passion for helping the public understand complex science topics in order to navigate the world better. In her own words, her goal is for people to realize that science is something to marvel at and embrace, not to use as a tool to scare people or coerce them into buying unproven products. Which leads to our topic that we're discussing today, which is dietary supplements. With supplements becoming a billion dollar business, it's more important than ever to understand what you're putting into your body and how to navigate the sea of marketing claims and scientific evidence. We'll be discussing how consumers can discern between credible scientific evidence and marketing hype the differences in quality of evidence from anecdotal reports to randomized control trials, and some of the common misleading marketing tactics used by supplement companies, and much, much more. We'll finish with practical advice on steps consumers can take to mitigate the risks associated with taking dietary supplements, and obviously get the benefits. And guys, as a reminder, at Revive Stronger, we're an online coaching company. Coaching is our bread and butter. We help clients grace the bodybuilding stage, do photo shoots, or just get bigger, stronger, become their best selves. We use our extensive experience and the knowledge gained from speaking to the world leading experts to generate fantastic results for our clients. If you're interested in personalized online coaching where you can ask questions, learn, and get amazing results, be sure to check it out. It's always linked in the description. But whether or not you're a seasoned athlete, a health enthusiast, or just curious about supplements, stay tuned for an enlightening and informative discussion. Let's get started. So Andrea, I actually first came across you on threads, believe it or not. Uh, I think uh, some of your posts over there seem to do really, really well for good reason. And I really enjoyed it because you were dispelling some myths over there and particularly like harmful kind of scary myths that for someone like myself and I think the audience, I was just talking that it's an evidence-based audience. We get very frustrated with those and uh, they get kind of consumed by the general public and they go wild. Uh, so then I followed you over on Instagram. I signed up to your newsletter and I'd just been digesting your content and it's just been ticking all the right boxes. And I was like, I need to bring Andrea onto the <laughs> podcast. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Thanks for having me, Steve. I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about science. And as I told you off air, the podcast is mostly like physique focus, like fat loss, muscle gain, kind of bodybuilding specific. But uh, and part of that is supplementation, which you've done a really excellent piece on. And I thought that was a great way to introduce the audience to you, your work, and they can hopefully follow you after this, dig into it more. And maybe I'll uh, bring you on again and we can dive into some of these kind of uh, more niche topics that are maybe outside specific bodybuilding. But uh, to start with supplementation, I thought would be great. And obviously, supplementation, especially in bodybuilding, is like a huge business. Uh, natural or enhanced, uh, we're natural bodybuilders basically on here versus the enhanced side, but it, it's it's huge business. And uh, how would you go about kind of, uh, where, where was I going? So how can consumers, this is the question, how can consumers uh, discern between credible scientific evidence and marketing claims when it comes to supplements? Do you have like a, a way that people can figure that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's really tricky because when we talk about supplements um, and, and when I talk about kind of the legality, I'm going to refer obviously to the US-based um, laws because that is what I'm most familiar with. Um, but when we talk about dietary supplements, it really fits in or it includes a really broad array of products. So when we think about supplementation, it's anything that's essentially a non-food substance that you're consuming. And so that could be as straightforward as a single ingredient um, vitamin or mineral. So like an iron supplement or a vitamin C supplement. Um, it can also be your multivitamins. But then, of course, it also includes a really broad array of other things. So we often... Um, Think of in the case of bodybuilding or fitness individuals, things like protein powders, um, amino acid supplements. Um, if we're talking about like uh, fish oils, fatty acids, omega threes, those are all supplements. Um, anything that's kind of marketed as a joint supplement, so chondroitin sulfate, collagen, any sort of peptide based things. 
um, a lot of sports performance supplements. So these could be um, fuels, you know, like for um, fitness fuels. Um, so if they if they have things like sugars in them or caffeine or amino acids, sometimes love creatine. Creatine, of course, falls under the umbrella of supplements as well. Um, and then it also includes other things like probiotics, prebiotics, which is really just a fancy word for fibers. Um, and also anything that's herbal, uh, herbal in nature, including herbal teas, which I think is really interesting. Um, so pretty much anything that's not classified as a food that you consume that's over the counter, that's not an FDA regulated medication and FDA here, we're talking about for, um, for us purposes, but it would be your UK or other regulatory agency for medications. Um, anything outside of that scope would fall under the category of supplements. And so, you know, there's a huge array, right? You know, and I think there's a general perception, even with some like these um, single ingredient micronutrients, you know, things that we know are essential for our health, like vitamin C, vitamin D, iron, copper, zinc, magnesium, et cetera, that, um, you know, because we need them in certain quantities for basic physiological processes, and we need certain quantities for optimal health, that more of something good is better. And that's just not the case. Um, you know, something that I say all the time and, and is really kind of a, a principle of toxicology is the dose makes the poison. And, it, and in reality, it's the dose and the route of exposure makes the poison. And everything um, can be potentially harmful at a certain exposure, even water. People can um, people can experience acute water toxicity, water intoxication, or, um, you know, acutely low levels of electrolytes as a result of um, excess water, and, you, and now your salt balances are not there. And so, you know, I think people forget that just because this substance or this chemical and everything is chemical. So I'm going to call them chemicals, but every, every one of these substances, just because it exists somewhere or it might exist somewhere in a food that we might encounter normally, um, means that a supplement is automatically beneficial or, or, or benign. Um, and that's not always the case. And so when we talk about, at least in the US, um, these don't have the legal requirement to demonstrate efficacy, first of all, meaning that they're actually doing something beneficial for your health um, or safety because they're not regulated by the FDA. And this is a fun little legal loophole in the US that was born um, in 1994. And it was really um, um, a political push for this medical freedom that actually coincided with a lot of the anti-vaccine sentiment and the emergence of the very lucrative wellness industry. And, um, you know, as a result, the market really exploded with, with dietary supplements that make claims that don't have evidence to support them. Um, so a lot of times you'll see things like on the label science backed or, you know, supported by evidence. And I think it's really important to remember that, you know, when we talk about supplements, um, you know, very often they're not doing clinical trials, right? So when they're saying science-based or evidence-backed, that might be true, but the science that they're using is probably not a human study that's representative. Um, usually what you find if you kind of check under the hood a little bit is that the science that they're citing is looking at one of the compounds in their supplement not in the actual supplement formulation, but in isolation in like a Petri dish study or in an animal model. And so, yeah, there's technically science to say chemical X has some theoretical function, but it's not representative of what's happening in a person. And on top of that, because chemical formulation is very complex, you can't just say, okay, well, we looked at this particular chemical in isolation and then we're going to throw it into our blended supplement thing. And therefore, it's going to have the same exact bioavailability and bioactivity and accessibility. And it's not going to interfere with any of the other chemicals in its formulation. And it's not going to interfere or har have harmful interactions with any of the other things in our body. And, and, and that's, I think, the biggest problem is that, you know, they kind of extrapolate data that's not representative to create false false sense of security in the consumer who are then buying these supplements yeah i think that's so well said it's uh i don't think uh, and i was very ignorant to this especially when i was first getting into like health and fitness it was just like oh yeah supplements and oh these are just 
your default good there can't be negatives and what you're mentioning there if there's research backing up x y or z supplement that's in isolation not necessarily combined together where they could have interference effects or i don't know some other complications involved so i think that's that's so well said something that i was actually wondering was would you include uh, things like protein powders within supplements as well so technically or legally, they are considered supplements because they're outside of your dietary consumption. Um, I will say that there are certain types of protein or amino acid supplements that are generally pretty well studied and they do have um, relatively good safety profiles and things like that. Um, and that they're you know, while they might not be regulated or, you know, demonstrated to have a therapeutic benefit in the context of people like bodybuilders who are trying to really kind of amplify their protein intake or so on, um, there are certain instances where they could have a benefit, you know, when there's this kind of perceived outcome, right? So creatine is obviously a very popular supplement. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, con it essentially contains three amino acids. Um, it does exist in our bodies and we can consume it, um, from various animal products, primarily seafood and red meat. Um, but typically, you know, when people are taking it as a performance enhancer, they're taking it in much higher levels of, you know, what you would actually consume in food. Now, Years ago, there was a lot of uh, fear about creatine in particular with regard to um, organ function and so on. And, um, you know, essentially there those have kind of been debunked. And so creatine is often taken by people in the athletic space to um increase performance because it's primarily stored in energy. And so it can increase essentially stamina um, of muscles or, you know, the resilience of muscles uh, before they get fatigued. Um, it can also, um, you know, often help with building muscle mass um, because it can be utilized, um, particularly in high intensity activities that you need a lot of uh, a short recovery window and, and so on. So, you know, while I wouldn't say everyone needs to take a creatine supplement because that data don't exist in the space of, you know, people who are taking it for a specific purpose in the case of, say, bodybuilding or physique building, um, it's generally viewed as safe to take. Um, but again, you know, I think the vast majority of individuals, the general population, there's not a therapeutic need to take it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, very well said. And something you also mentioned was like products saying science backed and they might be referencing some very obtuse study that's, I don't know, looking at rats or something like this. It's not looking at humans. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you run the audience through, uh, as far as you're concerned, kind of the quality of evidence, the spectrum yeah, from absolutely. anecdotal reports to randomized control trials? Yeah. So typically when we're looking at the hierarchy of evidence uh, about any topic, you have to really think, you have to view everything in in cumulation. And so when we say the consensus data or the consensus on a given topic, it's it's I think it's often perceived that like some scientists are sitting around at a table and are like, yeah, we all agree this. This looks good, you know, but that's not what it actually means. Consensus in the context of scientific consensus basically means that the comprehensive body of data within a given topic um, demonstrates very distinctly that the conclusion of the comprehensive body of data says X, as opposed to some alternative conclusions that might say Y. And so there's always going to be contrarians. And we see that many contrarians tend to be the ones that get a lot of attention and they often use their authority to kind of, you know, garner appeal and so on. But when we're looking at the body of data, not only are we just looking at all of the different studies, but we're looking at the quality of the studies and how representative are they to the actual phenomenon that we're investigating. So if we want to look at the impact, potential therapeutic impact or harm, potential risk of, say, a protein supplement, in people for muscle mass building, we have to utilize data or weigh data that are more representative of that population when we're taking all of the data and making these conclusions. So if you're looking at 
cells that are growing on a piece of plastic, which are Petri dish studies, you know, that's very, very different to what's happening in a human being, which have complex structures and functions and so on. I mean, you can do anything to cells in a Petri dish. You can um, pour tap water on them and you'll explode them all because cells can't survive in a, what we call a hypotonic environment. Um, plain water doesn't have enough salt and you would rupture all the cells. You could, you know, treat them with pretty much any chemical and you could cause them to die, but that's not what's happening in a person. And so we use Petri dish studies to start to understand mechanisms of how things um, generate responses in an organism, but it's not the end all and be all. And so usually from there, you're going to move to an animal study, but even within animal studies, you have to remember that different species are different and humans are a different species than all other animal models that we utilize, even more closely related animals like primates. Um, and so if you're doing a study in mice or in rats or in, in guinea pigs or in rabbits or in dogs, you can use some of that information, but you have to approach it with the caveat that that's not a person. And there's been some really important um, examples of this being misrepresented and misunderstood. And so one I like to talk about a lot is a lot of the fear about saccharin, which is a non-nutritive sweetener. And that was um, it was actually temporarily banned because some of the data that were used to assess saccharin, um, we're using a particular breed of rat that had a very genetic, very different genetic profile that caused them to develop crystals in their bladder after consuming saccharin and, and not just like a normal amount of saccharin. It was like 10% of their body weight every single day. So like excessive amounts of saccharin. Um, but these crystals in their bladder was leading to essentially damage, you know, wounding because it's scraping the inside of the bladder. And in a small proportion of the male rats, they ended up developing bladder tumors from all of that repetitive damage. So then it became this, oh, well, saccharin causes bladder cancer. But that wasn't the story because humans metabolize and process and excrete saccharin completely differently than this particular strain of rat, but that was not well understood. And so it created a ton of fear. Uh, it led to banning of, of saccharin in particular, but then all the follow-up studies that looked in other non-rat species, so mice, several species of monkeys, and then of course in humans, could never reproduce any of that data. Um, and so it's really important to kind of understand you know, whether or not the the model you're using is even translatable to humans. Um, and and that's particularly true with like immunology because the immune systems of different animals are very, very different. For example, um, once upon a time, I studied Lyme disease. And while dogs can get Lyme disease, it's a bacterial infection, um, cats don't get Lyme disease. And so if you were trying to use a cat as a research model, it would be completely unrepresentative of what happens in humans. And even the mouse models that we use to study it, we have to use genetic variants because mice are reservoirs. They don't actually get sick from the bacteria. They carry it forever. And so it's very, very different. Um, and so that's why those are kind of ranked lower on the hierarchy. And so once you move into human data, you have different tiers of that as well. You have survey based data, which is, you know, you're relying on the person to report information that can be subject to a variety of biases. Then you have things that are um grouped um, human studies, but they're maybe not controlled. So there's confounding variables. So like if you're looking at a, a dietary outcome, but you're not strictly controlling what every single person eats, you know, uh, to, to, you know, the T, then there are things that could be impacting the outcome that you're measuring. And so the gold standard is often these randomized controlled trials where people are segregated into groups randomly and and, the, and there's only one thing that's changed between groups and the demographics are essentially stratified and and um, so they're representative of like the whole population. You have different ethnicities, ages, et cetera, and nobody knows what they're actually getting. And so these often include a pl placebo. So one arm is getting a placebo and they don't actually know that. And the other arm is getting some therapeutic treatment or intervention. And not only do the participants not know it, but the researchers generally don't know it. And that's called a double blind. And so that l limits how much bias you can get from the data that you're collecting, uh, because you should be looking at it just from an objective perspective. Now, 
those can still be skewed because if you don't have enough people in there, if you're not controlling appropriately, or if you're not measuring an actual relevant outcome. And so, you know, that's why we have to look at everything, um, you know, under the umbrella of a given topic before we can make an assumption. And I think often when I'm debunking topics, people will send like one-off papers that they found on, on PubMed. And because it's called NCBI NIH, they think it's coming from an NIH funded study when in fact PubMed is just a repository. It's just like Google Scholar, it's just hosting papers. And um, if you haven't been trained on how to do a true literature search on there, you can type in a whole array of different selective keywords and it's it's going to essentially cherry pick for you what you're trying to find. And, and I could find a study to support any claim. Um, it doesn't mean that it's representative of what exists on that topic. Yeah, I think that's that's so well said, and I think it's it's where I think people who don't understand science uh, get frustrated with it because they will say something like, "Oh, you can find a paper to prove anything." It's like, yeah, but there's quality, and uh, there's certain studies are seen to be more um, e like stronger evidence than others, essentially. And I think most of the listeners will be aware of things like meta analyses and systematic reviews as being like some of the ones that they're they're kind of like the scientific consensus in a way, right? They're like taking in the body of evidence and then weighing yeah. it appropriately. Yeah, exactly, but. But, you know, even those can be flawed because they're dependent on the studies you're including. And so you're essentially you're you're saying, OK, well, I'm going to look at, you know, 20 studies about this topic and I'm going to assess, you know, the overall summary. So if, you know, garbage goes in, garbage is going to come out. And so, you know, there can be really poor meta analyses as well as systematic reviews. And that, I think, is the biggest the biggest frustration because, you know, People, the public, I think they want to understand credible science, but it takes so much training to be able to sit and kind of parse out all of these things. And, you know, even within a single study, it takes a really long time to kind of look through, OK, well, what were the materials and methods? Did they include the right number of subjects? Did they include the right variables? Did they include the right data points? Did they even you know, apply the right analyses of the raw data, you know, and and there's a lot of kind of fudging the numbers, you know, messing with p-values, making things look more polished. Sometimes you'll even see like they'll skew the axes on a figure. And so, you know, it's really, it's not as simple as just like skimming an abstract. And often an abstract doesn't even necessarily represent what, what the data in the paper say. And so, um, I, I would love a world if everyone could be able to do this, but but that's what we train for. That's what scientists train for. That's 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 my specialty is picking apart papers and, you know, doing research. Um, I'm not an expert on, you know, a whole other set of things, um, you know, but I think there's a desire to do this because these are topics that impact people individually. And so they want to feel like they can con they have some control over it. But what happens when when kind of people who aren't trained to interpret these studies get a hold of them is that it leads to this misinformation. It leads to exaggerated or misrepresented claims. And, and a lot of that can cause completely unfounded fears about things that people don't need to be worrying about. Again, very well said. It's it's unfortunate. I think people want their guru who has the answer to everything, but it's like that's like you said, the scientists that are trained in one area and have that specific expertise, I, like, as you go higher and higher in education, it gets more and more specific because it's so damn deep. And yeah. then you get, unfortunately, people who represent themselves as gurus and completely talk out of their scope of practice, which is really unfortunate. Even for myself, I like to read some studies here and there that are specific to kind of the realm of hypertrophy and kind of building muscle and losing fat. But I know I'm not a trained scientist to be able to delve into it to the level that other experts in the field will. Uh, whereas I know my kind of expertise in within, like as a practitioner, I kind of, that's why I do the podcast as it were, to kind of reach out to people like you who are experts in a field. So then I can kind of, okay, what can I draw from those individuals and learn to then apply it in practice? And I think, uh, yeah, unfortunately, not a lot of people also take that approach. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a shame because, because I, I think that there's a, an appetite for accessible and digestible science on topics. But what ends up happening is that, you know, we find that, you know, people maybe started out with good intentions. And then when when they got more, you know, 
fame or, you know, notoriety, then they started to kind of stray outside of what they really do understand. And then they are perceived as, as this guru. And, you know, I often even get asked, like, who else do you recommend for, for, science. And it's like, well, you know, I, there's never going to be a single person that I'm ever going to recommend for all of the science topics. I mean, even, you know, your, your most famous public figures in science are still science experts in, in a niche. And, um, you know, certainly like there are overlaps in certain disciplines, you know, in, in, biomedical science, you know, there's overlap with immunology and, and, you know, with me with infectious diseases and also cancer immunology. And, and that leads to cell biology and physiology and biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, but there, you know, there are areas outside of that, that I know very little about. And, and that's because it's not something that, you know, I've focused on, studied, worked in, done any research in. And so, you know, it also is is really important to understand your own limitations and, you know, and that really goes into how you interpret a study too. I remember early in the COVID pandemic, and and I use this as an example because it was really, I remember it was very frustrating to me because there were all these media headlines about how, um, you know, a study was suggesting that COVID was sexually transmitted. And and when I looked at the paper, they were doing a um, they were doing a study in uh, a cell line. So these are essentially petri dish cells that you would utilize um, to kind of you know parse out mechanism, right? And the cells that they were using are a type of cell called jerkats, and these are a type of T cell that have been essentially modified over a long period of time. And so they're like, well, we use these jerkats, and all of the cells in the culture were jerkats, and and the virus was able to infect them. But that doesn't mean that it's, you know, infecting, sorry, they were saying that it was, it was causing, um, you know, immune system issues. And it was like, well, if you're only using T cells in your culture, some virus is eventually going to infect them. And then, you know, there will be virus in those T cells. It doesn't mean that in the context of a human infection that they're going to preferentially infect T cells. And it's not, you know, and and people were likening it to HIV, which actually does preferentially infect T cells. Um, and then there was another paper, another media headline where they were talking about, um, you know, it being sexually transmitted because these these ICU patients, uh, Japanese men, um, you know, they had high viral load in their in their, um, you know, seminal fluid. And it's like, well, yeah, but they're in the ICU. There's six of them. They're they're just brimming with virus. You're going to find it in all sorts of places. That doesn't mean that in the scope of the actual disease course in the, the wild um, that it's going to be sexually transmitted. And so, again, if you're missing kind of these fundamentals within a type a topic, you know, how would you know that your cats, cats are not an appropriate cell type? Or how would you know that, you know, you can't make that extrapolation from these these extremely ill people that have ex, you know exceedingly high levels of, of viremia because they're super sick, right? That's not what's happening if a person is ambulatory and they're just a trans transmission source. And so, obviously, I think one of the ways some of the other, to bring it back to supplements, one of the ways that companies will try and kind of sell supplements is using. Uh, misrepresenting data or cherry picking data are there other ways that supplement companies try and kind of mislead people or like sales tactics to try and get you to buy their supplement yeah a lot of times they're gonna make you know usually if you see like buzzwords where they're talking about some perceived health benefit whether it's so legally they're not allowed to say that supplements um, can treat or cure a specific disease However, there's a lot of supplement companies that violate this, and it's really hard for FDA or, you know, whatever regulatory agency involved to get involved with that because they don't have the bandwidth and they have to really prioritize. So a lot of times those companies, they'll they'll be legal proceedings, but they'll still be selling their products. Um, but usually, like if they're making very buzzy sounding claims, like things like improving gut health. Boosting, boosting immunity, uh, helping brain function, improving performance, you know, any of these things that have these nebulous like, oh, it's going to make me 
better in some way. It's going to augment me in some way. It's going to, you know, amplify something in some way. Those are usually uh, clues or red flags that they're they're making claims that are not supported by evidence. Um, and and the immune boosting claim is something that's really a sticking point for me because your immune system isn't a muscle. You can't flex it. You can't boost it. Um, there's hundreds of different components. So if you were boosting it, what component are you boosting? And what is the end result of that boosting? And so on and so forth. And so usually if they're making those claims, they're taking, they're using some isolated study in a Petri dish or in an animal where you're probably using an excessively high amount of whatever chemical in, in, um, you know, in that context and, you know, they're looking at some sort of biomarker, right? Oh, well, we saw, you know, an increased uh, production of chemical, you know, Y, which is involved in, you know, immune cell signaling, or if we're talking about brain function, oh, well, you know, we know that uh, neurotransmitter signaling involves, you know, the use of tryptophan, therefore tryptophan is going to be good for brain health, you know, these are all the claims. And so this is kind of the crux of the pseudoscience is that they take these nuggets of truth that, that have, a place in the scope of science or science mechanism, and they misapply it to a supplement and to your overall health, which is not how that actually works. And that's assuming that the substance in that supplement is even bioavailable. And because a lot of these companies don't have to demonstrate evidence that whatever their formulation is, that the compounds in question actually get to where they need to be and are usable by the body, you a lot of these you end up just excreting in your urine. Um, and so you're just paying a lot of money for something that's not actually benefiting you and you'd be better off just you know, eating um, some produce or Greek yogurt or, or something like that that we know is more bioavailable. One that immediately comes to mind as you talk through this <clears throat> with those kind of claims are greens powders. They've just, uh, I see so many, especially because there's a particular one that's like on every like big podcast that's obviously pushed dramatically. And it just frustrates me because some of the, uh, the, the people who are marketing it know what they're doing and saying things like, you know, you don't eat enough fruit and veg, so you should use this product. And it's just like, you could actually be harming people quite dramatically there because people might just be like, oh, why would I even eat fruit and veg when I can just take this like powder that's going to cover all the bases and more? So I, yeah, it's, it really grinds my gears. Uh, I can see it does for you too. <laughs> it's, it's such a problem because, you know, even aside from the fact that it's better to get those nutrients in actual food products, um, it's also this like, elitism because these greens powders are usually super expensive as well. And it creates this like perception that if you're not buying all these supplements, you're somehow not doing what's best for your health. And that's just not true, you know, and, and, you know, produce in whatever form you can afford, whether that is frozen produce or fresh produce or a mixture or throw some canned produce in there, that is always going to be the best option. And, you know, this kind of privilege mentality of like, well, if you're not buying the this and the this and the, you know, it's just there's no evidence, there's no data to support it to begin with. And you're making people feel guilty about not doing all of this stuff that doesn't have evidence to support it anyway. And beyond that, because these greens powders, they often use these legal loopholes that apply to dietary supplements where they can say, well, we don't, we're not going to disclose our full list of ingredients because it's a proprietary blend and, and we're protecting it under trade secrets. You don't actually know everything that you're consuming. And while some of the things that are in there might be benign, especially with a lot of these herbal supplements and remedies, herbs contain hundreds of chemicals, right? And, and if you don't know what's actually in the things you're consuming, um, many of them can cause acute liver toxicity. It's actually a very common cause of emergency room visits. Um, 
They can also interact with actual medications. They can just decrease the absorption of real micronutrients you actually need. And that's true even with the like obvious ones like zinc and copper and iron. Like, you know, there 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 can be a lot of kind of cross uh, interference uh, and, and impacts on absorption if you're overdosing on one. Um, and so I think, again, it gives this perception of, well, we just dried out some produce and we blended it up and we put it in a bag and here you go. But that's not what they're actually doing, you know, and they're making these in labs that are not regulated for chemical formulations. And so they could be contaminated. They could be adulterated. They could be sourcing raw materials that have not, um, you know, passed muster in the context of regulatory compliance, because again, the dietary supplement world is really the wild west. And so, you know, there have been instances in herbal supplements being tainted with, with, you know, not healthy levels of heavy metals and other sorts of chemicals because of where the raw materials were sourced from. The soils were, you know, high in arsenic or things like that. And so, you know, we we need to be like more cognizant of the fact that just because something is branded as being all natural or, you know, just the same as eating a real vegetable doesn't actually mean that that's the case. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. Yeah, I think it's uh, bodybuilders would be very aware of this because pre-workouts were notorious for having proprietary blends for the longest time. And I think at least with this audience, for sure, if they saw that on a pre-workout, they'd be like, no way I'm taking that. It's like, I have no idea what I'm getting. So when I see that on any other product, and I think a lot of the audience the same, it's just like, oh, why would I take something I don't know what I'm actually getting? It could have, it's probably, or at least the way I think about it, it's probably got the, not the right doses of things and they're mm -hmm. just filling it with fillers and stuff like this. And something you mentioned there was the financial cost, of course, which I think a lot of people will think, oh, yeah, supplements, like if if I take X, Y, or Z, uh, I'm, I've got the money, so I'll, I'll just get it. But there's risks, as you mentioned, outside of just that, because, I, and you mentioned it actually uh, previously, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, uh, which just and again, allows the supplement industry to get around these things. Um, I don't know if you have more to say on that specifically. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, again, the 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 DSHEA essentially, you know, said that there there are kind of laws that, you know, have to be adhered to because um, previously they, you know, dietary supplements, at least in the U.S., uh, used to be regulated by the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act of 1938, which which required the clinical data and the clinical trials and the FDA regulation. Um, and that was actually started in the 1930s because people were literally making their own magical miracle elixirs and selling them at the local pharmacy. And, and they were pretty much putting whatever they wanted in there. Um, there was a, a really famous instance in uh, the U.S. where a liquid antibiotic, um, sulfanilamide, sold in um, 1937. Um, and people were like, hey, we need to make this more palatable for kids because they're going to, you know, they're not going to want to eat this if you know, they, they're prescribed it. So they were like, Hey, we're going to put something in there as a solvent. That's going to be very sweet. And it's going to taste delicious. And it was diethylene glycol, which is a, an ingredient in the antifreeze. And it is highly toxic at relatively low doses. So this was in the, um, 
the sulfonilamide liquid antibiotic killed 107 people. Um, and this actually was kind of the birth of um, FDA regulatory um, oversight on on these types of substances. And so, you know, we had a pretty good stint where where there was oversight on a lot of things that were being sold. But um, you know, starting in the 1950s, which was actually not that soon after that, but um, you had the John Birch Society and a lot of political push um, in order to kind of reduce oversight. And, and you had this kind of coinciding of the, the wellness industry and the healthcare autonomy. And this also included the um, organic agriculture market, which is really heavily marketed toward, you know, well, it's better for you, even though there's actually no evidence to support any of that. And, it, and it's actually ecologically worse. But but um, but then you had this really bipartisan push um, to to create this DSHEA in the U.S. And this essentially took dietary supplements out of the purview of the FDA um, and created this this new criteria. And so that was passed in 1994, and it essentially replaced the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, and there's there's so many loopholes that um, dietary supplement companies can really kind of skate by and get away with a lot um, because it's only after demonstrated evidence of harm that the FDA or the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, can even get involved. Um, so none of these companies have to get pre-market approval before selling something on the shelves, which is kind of concerning. Um, it's 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 less stringent than how our food supply is regulated. And so, um, you know, it, it requires that they have a label that includes accurate information about the, the ingredients and the serving sizes and the recommended daily intake. But again, there's loopholes for these proprietary blends where they're not actually disclosing the actual amounts. Um, and again, because they don't have good manufacturing processes in their laboratories, they don't have quality control, so they could have extreme lot to lot variation where they could say, OK, this 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 pill has 100 micrograms of something in it. One lot might have 10 micrograms and one lot might have a thousand micrograms. So you might be inadvertently overdosing because of poor manufacturing processes, because their manufacturing facilities are not required to be inspected and approved like um, like is required in actual FDA regulated medications. Um so they're not allowed to say that they can treat, diagnose, cure, or prevent diseases. But again, we know that they violate this. Um, they're not supposed to lie about product safety, but this burden is on the manufacturer. So, you know, guess where that gets you. Um, and, um, um, you know, essentially that also created this Office of Dietary Supplements that falls under, um, you know, NIH in order to um, enhanced supplement research. And so there's a lot of supplement research that's been ongoing. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of studies and kind of the big TLDR for most dietary supplements is that there's not evidence to support them. And many of them, uh, can be harmful. And so, you know, if you're really set on taking a supplement, you need to at least, um, find one that has some sort of third party testing, because again, these products are being sold essentially by the company saying, yeah, no, it's it's all good. We promise. And it's very, very different from how actual regulated medications are overseen. There's multiple layers of, of you know, uh, outside, you know, regulatory overview. And I know, you know, people want to say otherwise, but as someone who works alongside regulatory, it is very, very strict. I mean, if you change a buffer in one piece of equipment that's on the line, that has to be documented, um, which is not the case when you're making supplements, which is, you know, essentially an un unregulated pharmaceutical. You know, people are not plucking these off of trees and saying, here, I found this in the woods for you. I mean, they're making these in labs. These are these are synthesized in laboratories. They're just not high quality laboratories. Yeah, that's that is scary and concerning. And that's the, what you described there was the thing that made me want to talk about this. Uh, I think thankfully after doing a little bit of research in the uk it seems that we have a little bit it's similar to how it was with the fda so it seems that we're a bit more proactive uh with more rigorous pre-market approval and process of stricter control over like the health claims and things which makes me feel a bit better about it here but the uh, majority of our audience i think are actually us based and i'm sure some of those uh, downfalls are also seen over here and you actually answered the question of e there's variability of quality even uh, within buying the same supplement from a company, oh, yeah. which is quite scary. Yeah, I mean, and you could buy the same same brand in different lots, and you know, I mean, if you use analytical chemistry equipment to analyze the the composition, it would be different. 
And I think you actually mentioned contamination uh, with some of these supplements. And I, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, someone who the audience will know, and you may know him uh, as well, Eric Helms, uh, he uh, kind of reviewed a narrative review uh, that concluded a multi-gradient uh, pre-workout supplements and supplements marketed as anabolic, performance enhancing, weight reducing, or fat burning. Uh, they have the highest prevalence of contamination and somewhere between 20 to 30% of those are contaminated. So a lot of those words are things that would be marketed towards like bodybuilders. Yeah. So when I heard that, I was kind of like, wow, like, I really need to, again, share this with the audience so that they're very aware that with their supplementation, it's not just, thankfully, the audience are aware that supplements are like the sprinkles on top of the cake that make very yes. little difference. So right. they're not investing a huge amount in them, but also they're people who want the best results and any little thing that will give them an edge, they want it. But now it's to make them aware, especially if they're naturals, that if they're taking a pre-workout or something that's a bit more complex, a proprietary blend, especially in the US, there's chances it could be t contaminated with things that could get them banned from competition or whatever well, that's, it might be. That, that's the other thing, you know, I mean, aside from the the health considerations, right, I was going to say, you know, I, I did um, competitive judo many years ago. And, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's all sorts of testing, you know, regulations and and all sorts of controlled substances. And so, you know, I mean, if you don't know what you're actually consuming for for some of your listeners who are, you know, taking these things to improve performance for a competition or so on, I mean, that that could be worse in the long run if they end up, you know, getting banned because they, you know, took something that had an adulterated substance. And 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 some of these, particularly with the pre-workouts and the anabolic supplements, they had um, you know, um, controlled hormones and things like that in them. That was part of what was contaminating them. It wasn't simply like, okay, well, it was this, you know, plant that was grown in this remote region that had really, you know, naturally high levels of arsenic in the soil or so on. It was things that were, you know, added, whether intentionally or not. And again, I'm, you know, wasn't at the lab, so I can't say, but, but, you know, they were things that were controlled and not allowed to be added and were actually in them. Um, you know, and, and I think the, the, the omission of ingredients for, you know, is, probably more concerning or more risky than the claiming there's ingredients in it that are not detectable. But when you actually look at when supplements are analyzed, you find both of those situations. You find things on the label that are being claimed to be in the supplement that are undetectable. And um, and then you find things that are not disclosed on the label that are detectable. And so for me, looking at a risk approach like that's more concerning because if those are substances that you have an underlying health condition and you could have a serious reaction to them or or it could interfere with your medication that you actually need you know those are really dangerous but then of course you're paying for something that's not actually there then you're wasting your money on top of it all yeah really well said and you kind of talked about this already in terms of how to navigate supplements and make sure that you're getting ones that are going to potentially benefit you and one of those was third-party testing is there anything else you think consumers can do outside of trying to buy from brands that are third-party tested so i think you know one of the things is you know and i understand like the desire to have blended supplements and so on but i think the simpler a supplement is if you are going to use supplements the better because there's less potential issues in manufacturing and formulation and interactions and in, in actually dispensing right and so if you're taking a mixed blend supplement and they're saying it's you know 20% x 30% y 50% z but because they're not using calibrated dispensing you're going to get very vari variable proportions of those so you know in reality it's best to control things in isolation and so if you're really set on taking certain types of of supplements whether it's amino acids or proteins or so on um you know making sure that they're avoid these proprietary blends avoid things that are um i would avoid like a lot of the boutique brands too especially the ones that have come up recently especially if they use the the buzzy claims right the leaky gut and the gut healing and the this and the that those are ones that you know are not doing any due diligence um and so you know granted supplements are not regulated by and large but there are larger supplement companies that have um 
that have not had um, issues with safety or compliance um, and things like that. You can also look on the um, HHS website um, and, and FDA has a repository called CARES, which is like VAERS, but it's for um, cosmetics and dietary supplements and so on. And you can actually go there and you can look at, they have a list of reports. Now this is passive, so anybody can file anything, but you could do a quick search to see if any brands uh, come up and, and flag those. Um, so that's another way to kind of, you know, suss out. Um, and then, and then on top of that, you know, I think, um, you know, just looking at kind of the, the history, you know, a lot of these, if there have been routine violations of manufacturing processes, there's going to be some sort of news report on them. So, you know, especially if you're going to be taking these at a relatively frequent basis, um, you know, you can kind of just do some due diligence before purchasing. So, you know, for example, there's this one company called Balance of Nature, and they advertise really heavily in a lot of more liberal media outlets here in the U.S. And they've actually been ordered by the court to stop selling products, but they're still selling them. Um, and they've 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 failed on multiple levels over multiple years. They didn't comply with good manufacturing. They didn't develop good operating procedures. They didn't have quality control. They were, they were Most of their products were adulterated. They made claims about curing and treating COVID. I mean, it's just like the gamut. And, um, and, and actually FDA and FTC have gotten involved. They've taken them to court. They've, it's ruled in their favor. They're still selling their products. And so, you know, you can look up to see if there's any kind of legal issues associated with a particular brand, um, you know, even separate from the third party testing and, and minimizing how many individual ingredients there are in, in a product. The only one I have in addition to that is uh, the use of licenses, like with Korea Pure. Uh, I don't know if creatine monohydrate is one of the ones that is most likely to be not what it says it is. I think it's actually probably one of the better ones. But there are things like that. And in terms of taking supplements, Andrea, I don't know if there's any you particularly would ever recommend um, or the, the resource I tend to go to to kind of find out if it's evidence-based is examine.com. I don't know if you're aware of that website you are. So that I tend to find that to be just a invaluable source because they have no sponsors or affiliations with uh, supplements and uh, people behind there seem to be very credible evidence base and they kind of go over the literature and uh, seem to they're, they're not trying to promote any particular supplement they're just giving you the lay of the land essentially they're looking through the quality of evidence and telling you whether or not it's going to be doing anything much uh, so yeah I don't know if there's anything you would recommend yeah I mean you know I think these are all good points and yeah you're absolutely right if they have like a trademark name on some you know ingredient that that's also often a red flag because if they're using a chemical compound you know they should just say what the chemical compound is um I personally don't I take one, I take one supplement and that is Metamucil, which is a um, psyllium husk fiber supplement. Uh, I actually don't even buy the name brand. I buy the Target brand because it's like half the price. Um, and I do that because I had a medical issue that required me to really prioritize an excessively high fiber diet. And after that resolved, I kind of had some PTSD and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to this, this helped. I'm just going to keep going. And it was recommended by my colorectal surgeon. Um, and that one is obviously a very safe thing. It's, it's essentially soluble fiber that, um, you know, is good for your GI tract. But, but again, I still try to get most of my fiber, which is really important, um, for any of the carnivore people that might be listening, um, for a lot of things aside from, you know, feeding your microbiome in your gut and ensuring that you're properly absorbing nutrients, but it also helps with regulating your um, triglycerides and blood sugar and cardiovascular function and all of that. So, you know, I generally try to eat as much fiber as possible in my diet, but I've just gotten in the habit of my eat my evening glass of Metamucil and I feel like an 80 year old grandma. Um, but I have had this discussion because I am a marathon runner and, um, you know, people are often incredulous that I'm not taking things like creatine or protein powder or anything like that. And I'm like, listen, like, you know, there are certain protein powders that have more uh, accessible protein. And I know a lot of people do that after, you know, long run recovery. And, and those are, again, generally safe, um, you know, especially if they're not, again, throwing in boutique blends of so on, if it's it's really just kind of a a, a protein. Um, but for me, you know, I'll usually 
eat Greek yogurt or eggs or something like that. If, you know, I, if I feel like I need to kind of bump up the protein. Um, so I think for me, it's, it's one of those things where I think, you know, you said it, Steve, that you want to lead with food and, and, you know, if you are taking supplements, especially in this athletic performance space, you know, it really should be the sprinkles on the top, right? Um, it, it should only be a situation where it's something for an intended purpose, or you have a specific medical indication or a specific deficiency. And in those instances, there's usually going to be a body of evidence to support that particular supplement in that context, right? There are, you know, during pregnancy, folic acid is recommended, you know, that's one of those exceptions as well. Um, but again, the exceptions are not the rule. And I think, you know, people often think, well, you can just pile more of this stuff on, it's going to be better. And and that's not um, necessarily the case. Yeah, it's one of those where I I, I think I flip-flopped where I took a lot of supplements just because I thought they were better. And then I really have like limited the amount I take. I will say I rely quite heavily on whey protein uh, just because I find it to be a tasty way to get in a lot of protein. But outside of that, I think at least in our space, it's like creatine monohydrate seems to be the most notoriable in terms of reliable effects and even in recent times that's been shown to not maybe have as potent effects as we thought on muscle growth and things like this so it's kind of disappointing but outside of that i tend to recommend people get maybe blood work done to see if they've got deficiencies in areas and like you said if they can do it through lifestyle get outside get some more vitamin d or what have you versus supplementation that's great uh, I should take my own advice, though, because I do tend to take like low doses of things I think I might be low in, but I don't get blood work done, partly hating needles and kind of it's just a bit of a faff to have to get it done. But uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully, like you said, single ingredient things, I'm hoping it's not too, too risky. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, also our body is pretty good at kind of regulating itself. And, and, you know, usually with these, even these essential micronutrients, like usually there are clinical signs of deficiencies and there is wiggle room. And so I think, you know, people get very kind of fixated on, okay, well, I need to make sure that I'm always within this range. And and the vitamin D story is actually really interesting because the, the thresholds were artificially inflated because of this guy who had a stake in kind of, scaring people about vitamin D deficiency. I actually wrote a newsletter specifically on that. It's a really wild story, but, um, but you also store a precursor in your fat cells and in your liver. And so even if you're not exposed to the sun every single day, you can liberate some of that and utilize it. Um, but, but beyond that, you know, I think you don't have to stress so much on a daily basis. Cause there's very, there's very few things that like a single insult or a single, like, neglect of is really going to do immeasurable harm. And so I think if people are kind of operating with good habits, good patterns, even if there's a divergence here or there, like it's not worth the anxiety because that can also not be great for your health. Um, You know, so for me, like I usually eat ice cream every single night because it makes me really happy and it's delicious and haven't died yet. Um, But I think, you know, we want to, I think there's, you know, just this kind of fixation on like doing everything right all the time. And, and I think, you know, people just underestimate the resilience and the, the regulation that our body has in order to ensure that like it operates, you know, up to, up to what it, you know, what it's equipped with. And, you know, it's, it's unlikely that a single thing, you know, is going to kind of throw you off the rails. You bring up a really good point. Uh, the, sleep has become really uh, highlighted as something that's foundationally important, especially even like for muscle gain, fat loss, but for for life in general. But so many people have gone down this kind of quick fix route of looking for all the supplements that could potentially help their sleep. And as you mentioned here, if someone has this kind of cocktail they take before bed and I don't know, they're away and they can't take it and suddenly they're like anxious, my sleep's going to be terrible and it breaks them down. Whereas I, I think it's just like you mentioned before, only take a supplement when you, you need it, not just because and uh, more is not better in that case. So I, I think uh, this has been a fantastic chat, Andrea. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, if people want to learn more from you, I've already mentioned your newsletter, Instagram threads. Uh, is there anywhere else they should be heading? I'll make sure I've got all the links that are in the description. Yeah, I mean, you can uh, you can head to my website. It's immunologic.org. Um, they, you, you can um, send me an email or submit a, you know, form with a message. I think you can also access the newsletter there and you can find all my social channels there as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Andrea. And thank you guys for listening. Thanks for having me.
Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it. And we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cup so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cup movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.